Yeah, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, <coughs> we are, uh, I'm presenting now a panel that is an experiment. That this came out of uh, an, uh, an experiment between each other and between the possibility of uh, thinking artistic research, thinking the problematics which might be intrinsic in, uh, in the process of making artistic research as a relation between three different approaches. So between a paper, uh, the first one, the uh, paper that Andres will present, Andres Laos, uh, which uh, um, focuses on aesthetics, my paper that is focused uh, on ontology and basically uh, from a point of view uh, starting from Deleuze which actually leads towards Leibniz while uh, Andres actually takes Kant as a, as a philosophical reference from the point of view of Deleuze. And then a uh, third presentation, Emilio Basket who is an artist um, and who presents the problematics um, related, the problematics which are intrinsic in his artworks, thinking um, these problematics from the point of view of uh, uh, philosophy and the rules. So the question that we're trying to pose by uh, putting together in a panel these very three different approaches is um, how is um, uh, or is can this pose a problem for artistic research, and um, uh, how can these different um, modalities of researching actually transform each other? All these modalities of researching that are here deal in a way or strive towards the problematics of uh, researching a transformation on the ground of experience. This is what accommodates us in our differences. And from this common denominator, the question is posed, okay, can there arise a problematic that might be called artistic research? So, let's start with uh, Andres Barros. Um, and uh, are you saying the title of your paper? Yeah. Um, Theors, uh, it's, a, it's a language experiment because I want to speak in French. And, um, and um, my paper is um, to, to cry à la, au sourire, the scream. Si vous n'êtes pas sensible au cri philosophique, vous n'êtes pas sensible à la philosophie. Dit Deleuze, de manière un peu intimidante dans son séminaire de 1900. Mais alors, qu'est-ce que ça peut être un cri philosophique Alors, je voudrais commencer à explorer cette question aujourd'hui en faisant référence à du texte ou la notion de cri dans ce rapport avec la pensée de Deleuze pour couper une place privilégiée. Il s'agit, le premier test, il s'agit d'un célèbre travail des cosmopolitiques de Philippe Fingar et Isabelle Estranger, publié à la découverte en 2005, qui s'appelle La sorcellerie capitaliste. Et, et ensuite, j'évoquerai les portraits d'orateurs de Gilles Deleuze, des, Claude Jaeglé, euh, publié dans la presse universitaire de France en première année. Alors, le premier test invite, je cite, à tracer un cercle pour protéger ou prolonger ce que Ingar Stenger appelle le cri des sillages. On se rappelle du cri Un autre word is possible. Ces cris peut être rapproché non sans problème de l'athlétisme philosophique que de les chercher à définir comme poussé des cris qui jalonnent une image de la pensée. 
Alors, ces rapprochements-là, euh, je vous invite à les faire. Je ne les ferai pas ici. Et je passe à cette deuxième test qui me semble à l'égard euh, de, de ce que j'appelle provisoirement une acoustique de la philosophie de Lucienne, euh, les textes de Jaeg, les portraits hors accordés de l'Est, me semble au contraire poser une approche plutôt réductrice du rapport créé pensé de cette, dans cette philosophie. Alors, je vous rappelle rapidement le schéma de l'analyse de Jaeg qui, qui trouve sa source doctrinale, je dirais, chez Aristote dans l'histoire des animaux. Alors, le schéma, c'est un peu près comme ça. À l'origine, il y a une voix inarticulée, la faune, et, comme on va dire, d'une son animal placée en deçà du seuil du langage. L'articulation de cette voix par les langages ou la langue déliée de l'homme donnait lieu à les formes conventionnelles de l'échange social. Or, si les, les oiseaux et si les oiseaux peuvent aussi articuler des mots, et les dauphins euh, sont capables de composer des sons qui sont transmis à leur, con, à leur euh, congénère, et pour Aristote, il y a des dialectos animaux qui ne sont pas seulement des cris de douleur ou des plaisirs. Il faut que la voix trouve dans l'homme une fonction proprement symbolique ou significative, une aussi simplement signalétique ou indicative, et, et que chez, chez les animaux doués de raison, il faut plus d'une appétit bouche. Euh, la parole devient logique, poétique, ou délibérative. Alors, Jaeglé ne fait que rendre plus romantique ce schéma, puisqu'elle va affirmer que sous l'élaboration conceptuelle de l'Est se trouve tapis, une espèce de voix féroce qui, au-delà de, de la formulation académique, devient la plus haute clarté des paroles inspirées. Alors dans cette analyse, les tournures de Deleuze sont réduites en un style dont les enfants fantastique rapproche à la fois l'intensité dramatique, l'intensité dramatique d'une poésie et la cadence médusante de la musique. C'était tout déjà réglé à ce que dans les mérites de souligner l'importance que Deleuze accorde dans ses séminaires à l'élaboration, à à dans ce séminaire, au, au thème des crimes, au sujet des crimes. Par exemple, en écoutant les courants enregistrés sur les Nice de 1980, on s'y aperçoit que Deleuze articule de très tôt les thèmes de cri avec la question de la création des concepts dans ses rapports à la musique et à la peinture. Alors, dans ces cours, Deleuze affirme que la philosophie, que les philosophes n'est quelqu'un qui, qui a quelque chose de spécial à signifier, ni quelqu'un qui chante le monde. Cette affirmation est, peut être mise en rapport tout de suite avec euh, l'expression et la célébration du monde pour la parole qu'on trouve par exemple dans la phénoménologie des Marocs. Pour Deleuze, le philosophe est quelqu'un quel, quelqu qui aurait les besoin de créer. Alors, l'écrit sur les mots singuliers du concept coupe et prolonge une sorte de monologue pré-philosophique que les appelle plus de pensées. Quatre ans plus tard, dans une course sur la pensée et le cinéma, de les revient au cri pour définir ce qui serait une image de la pensée. Alors, la notion linguistique des chronotopes proposée par Bakhtin et la distinction ornithologique entre cri d'alarme et chant nuptial va bah, bah, lui permettre de considérer l'écrit comme un signal qui jalonne l'image de la pensée présupposée par la méthode et le discours philosophique. Pour Deleuze, dégager cette image implique, implique un effort supplémentaire à la compréhension philosophique. Il va permettre de quantifier, selon lui, l'apport créatif d'une philosophie en fonction de l'écrit poussé ou des poussé. 
Ainsi, il évoque ou il quantifie euh, la philosophie de l'Église et les principes de raison suffisants quand il est jugement synthétique a priori, Descartes, il est cogito, il y a Aristote, il a un antestinat. C'est une sorte de tableau classificatoire. Alors, mais, mais, mais le thème du cri n'apparaît pas seulement dans, dans les cours enregistrés. Il joue aussi un rôle déterminant dans la loi recré. Dans l'image mouvement, par exemple, la manière d'y arriver au cri permet de distinguer les montages dialectiques organiques du cinéma soviétique euh, des, euh, des les montages expressionnistes du cinéma allemand qui va être défini pour les rapports de la lutte intense entre la lumière et l'ombre ou l'effort pour faire sortir du chaos une forme spirituelle. Dans les pays, les principes d'air sont suffisants et définis comme on crée qu'ils signalent une classe d'êtres, qui sont les identiques, dont les principes philosophiques est seulement la manière de les connaître et de les entendre. Enfin, ben, qu'est-ce que c'est la philosophie Il y a avec Batari, les crisements, les cris, les crisements, est présenté comme un trait diagrammatique de l'image dite moderne de la pensée. Je vais m'attarder sur cette édition du crisement comme un trait, ou comme un signe ambigu de l'image de la pensée que Deleuze et Batari appellent moderne. Mais avant de cela, je veux souligner l'usage critique et clinique, très pédagogique, que les fait de cette notion à la lumière d'une histoire polémique de la philosophie. Je veux évoquer seulement quelques moments décisifs de cette histoire. Dans Nietzsche, la philosophie, les cris multiples de l'homme supérieur, selon l'interprétation que les fait du cri des détresse de Zarathustra permet de rapprocher d'un côté les devenir réactifs de la culture et la conscience malheureuse de l'âme dialectique, tout en séparant la nature du dernier homme de celle du surhomme. Et ceci, contre l'interprétation de la pensée nichéenne de Heidegger, pour qui l'homme traditionnel doit être surmonté par un sous-homme prêt à conduire l'animal métaphysique à la plénitude de son destin. Dans différentes répétitions, quelques années après, les cris passionnés isolés de l'homme du sous-sol, la protestation pleine de sang et de mauvaise volonté de l'idiote de la littérature plus, se constitue pour Deleuze dans la répétition NTT. Et les commencements radicaux d'une pensée dans la bêtise ne se laisse pas représenter pour ce que tout le monde reconnaît. Les mêmes années, dans les spinozis et les problèmes de l'expression, Deleuze interprète l'escolie de la deuxième proposition de la troisième partie de l'éthique. Je cite Nous, nous ne savons pas ce dont le corps est capable, comme un cri de guerre. Dans ces cris de guerre, de les particuliers, la fête tous spinozistes et la fête nichien, selon les modes de composition du corps et les rapports des forces, d'une politique dont, dont les lois sont identiques à la puissance du droit et non du devoir moral. Dernier exemple, dans l'image mouvement, de les oppose la réponse des personnes et des pourcelles à la crise historique de la perception naturelle. Pour Deleuze, les cris éclatant des matières et mémoire, à savoir toute conscience est quelque chose, des les chamans qui va du mouvement à centrer du monde vers les champs des perceptions organisées par une forme d'intentionnalité. Les cris des guerres des vers son nom se présentent à la à l'encontre du cri repris par Sartre et par Merleau-Ponty, les cris des Rousseau, toute conscience et conscience de quelque chose. Les cris des guerres des versants va faire de l'univers les crânes sans œil ou la luminescence sans lampe d'une cinéma dont l'image mouvement est identique à la matière. Or, à 
avec cet exemple si avec ce que je viens de dire, on, peut, on, on voit bien les caractères opérationnels et pédagogiques de la notion d'écrit par rapport à l'histoire de la philosophie qui est de les pratiques. On voit mal pourquoi l'écrit peut être considéré comme dans cette histoire, comme les traits d'une pensée dont l'image serait dite moderne. Alors, ce qui est pour Deleuze, faire des tableaux et des classifications fondées dans les, des catégories d'analyse qui on pourrait croire révolues ou illégitimes, comme modernes ou classiques, résulte intéressant si l'analyse comporte une évaluation des traits, des signes qui caractérisent qui caractérise un mouvement artistique ou un mouvement dépensé. Ainsi, lui, non seulement quantifie les philosophes pour leur, pour leur cri, mais il quantifie aussi les plans philosophiques pour leurs traits diagrammatiques, négatifs ou positifs, autant qu'il quantifie les personnages conceptuels pour leurs leur symptômes. On comprend alors que l'image moderne de la pensée soit définie pour un signe ambigu tel que la montée du crisement, du bégaiement et de la glossolalie. Ces traits-là, non sélectionnés dans des autres images de la pensée, signalent pour Deleuze et Guattari le mouvement d'une pensée qui se voit forcée à créer ou à essayer de créer dans l'aurore plutôt que dans les troncs. Alors, la définition du cri comme trait de l'image moderne de la pensée exige pourtant quelques précisions. Il faut d'abord souligner que la notion de trait diagrammatique, diagrammatique semble déplacer presque insensiblement la question du cri, du registre sonore, vers un registre visuel. Tout se passe comme si l'acoustique de la pensée, lorsqu'elle est rapprochée à la topique du plan de pensée, perd un peu de matérialité sonore pour devenir une image graphique ou géométrique. Cependant, si on tient compte de l'élaboration de cette notion par Guattari, on peut affirmer que les traits diagrammatiques sont immédiatement audiovisuels. C'est que en effet, dans l'inconscient machinique de, Wat de Watari, écrit avant de, de mille plateaux, de qu'est-ce que c'est de la philosophie, Watari va mobiliser les distinctions pragmatiques de la sémiotique de Peirce et la glossématique de James Lebb pour, pour penser les processus de déterritorialisation du visage. Alors, selon Watari, les couples de la voix et du visage constituent sur la forme d'expression personnologique et la capitalisation sémiotique du signifiant, du signifiant, une machine binaire toujours détraquée pour les traits de la visagité. Alors l'importance que les les concepts ou diagrammatisme du visage dans sa critique constante d'une asubjectivité clivée par les structures de la linguistique trouve dans le plateau et avec des laisses un rôle crucial. Elle s'impose alors de penser l'avenir d'un visage qui serait, pour Deleuze et Guattari, une sorte de destin. L'avenir du visage comme un destin, c'est de faire au, pro, au profit d'une pure fonction de matière dont les particules signes passent entre les formes et les contenus hétérogènes. Alors, dès lors, la question de la machination de la voix et de la figuration du visage prend une dimension technique accrue pour une philosophie où l'avenir du visage résulte à la fois indissociable de la désorganisation du corps ou de l'organisation du corps. Dans ces conditions, l'écrit devient un véritable cas spécial où se jouent non pas seulement les rapports au séjour, non pas les rapports de la parole à la pensée, mais celui du corps au visage. Alors, c'est cette manière d'aborder la question, c'est par immédiatement de toute une tradition 
qui a fait de la trace, il pas du trait, de Heider à, à, de Heider à Derrida, un élément important pour penser les rapports entre la parole et la pensée. Alors, avec Deleuze, l'écrit devient un signe distant, ambigu, alors, selon qu'il s'agisse de la de les processus qu'il appelle esclésophrénisation de l'écriture ou hystérisation de la peinture. Dans la formule d'Arto, laquelle affirme qu'il faut rester la langue pour toucher la vie, des lesbois ont procédé actif de désorganisation du langage qui transforme la valeur phonétique des lettres organes par l'action tonique du cri souffle. Les cris d'Arto sont les crépitements d'une langue affective dont le ciment est fluide et les corps organiques. Dans un autre registre, lorsque Bacon affirme qu'il faut prendre les cris, les cris plutôt que l'horreur, pour Deleuze, cette vue comporte la déformation des figures par l'exploration amévoïté des compteurs des contours. Ainsi, la bouche qui crie devient un organe indéterminé par lequel les corps s'échappent vers une aplate matérielle vif et dure. Si on peut dire, comme on le fait, dès lui-même, que l'effet intensif du corps sans organe permet de rapprocher Bacon et les cris indiquent plutôt à les séparer. D'une part, les cris soufflent, c'est une action qui plonge les mots dans la profondeur du corps, tandis que, d'autre part, les cris pensent, c'est une opération qui mesure les figures dans la profondeur maigre du système corps couleur plan. Cette mince différence technique marque la traversée délicate qui présuppose passer pour Deleuze de l'analyse critique et clinique du rapport corps-langage à celui du rapport corps-figure. Alors, le premier rapport corps-langage sera défini pour Deleuze comme une lutte entre la bouche qui englottit les mots et les cerveaux qui parlent des de manger, tandis que les douciennes implique une lutte entre la bouche qui crie et les corps qui cherchent à s'échapper par les trous ouverts dans la viande. Cette nouvelle lutte de la logique de la sensation et pas de la logique du sens implique de nouvelles forces qui ne trouvent pas dans la, dans la première lutte, celle du corps langage. Alors, je vous rappelle que dans la logique du sens, elle est développée une sorte de roman logique et psychanalytique de l'idée d'une genèse du son, du sens animé par les non-sens. Cette genèse engage une série de transformations énergétiques, telles que les pulsations physiques, qui deviennent des, pouls, des pulsions libidinales, pour se transformer ensuite dans l'énergie potentielle d'une surface désexualisée, la surface désexualisée du langage. Dans cette, dans cette transformation, les systèmes sonores du corps, dont les cris soufflés d'Arto fait partie, retrouvent son plein goussage dans une bouche libérée du bruit, il possède pour la voix venue des noms et remplie des paroles insolites. Avec les cris pan, avec Bacon, des les explore les forces d'isolement, des déformations et des dissipations des figures, ainsi que les, que les langages qui correspondent aux cris souffles des artos menacent du fond les corps langages d'une catastrophe, la faillite de l'organisation inappréciable ou inaperçue du point de vue logique de la surface, avec les cris pan des bikes, la profondeur superficielle de la viande supporte l'insistance d'un sourire qui conserve les contours de la bouche. 
Alors, si l'isolement de la figure rendrait visible la lutte du corps dans son armature, la déformation du visage par l'écrit rend visible la tête ou la figure qui se dissipe en conservant une inquiétante sourire. Et là, je vous remercie. Quelques questions directes ou autrefois euh, on lance les questions à la fin. C'est en anglais. Ah, oui. Est-ce qu'il y a une question directe pour Andrés ou nous laissons à l'autre, nous laissons toutes les questions à la fin pour soutenir la discussion entre les deux papiers Peut-être que c'est What would you prefer? What, would, what did you plan? Well, the idea was uh, one or two questions after each paper. So I didn't say okay. before. Uh, uh, and then, but then leave actually some space for the discussion okay. at the end. And the discussion is in, the discussion is in English? In both English? languages. Okay. Um, uh, everybody is understanding French or, or not? No, or so, so it's better in English, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm really fully convinced by uh, uh, I think the main articulation that you propose on the on the screen, the, the, the key, uh, which is on the one hand uh, uh, Nietzsche, and I think that. Uh, uh, as a question of the Zarathustra's animals yeah, is absolutely fundamental because this is, I mean, intuitively and conceptually absolutely sure yeah, that it is in, in Deleuze's investment of, of, of Nietzsche yeah, that the screen becomes really a philosophical question. Yeah, as if the screen uh, could be uh, immediately projected into the end of Nietzsche and philosophy. Okay. So I think I think it works well. And then, of course, Nietzsche Artu, which is absolutely fine, perfect, and we see the full development. And now, for example, in logic of sense. Arto is a kind of, of, of um, uh, Nietzsche's return yeah? uh, into his structuralist, post-structuralist, uh, Carolian uh, uh, logic uh, uh, of sense. And then we have effectively Bacon, and once more, I think that the parallel uh, between Arto and Bacon, knowing that Arto is absolutely fundamental in Deleuze, Bacon is I'm working beautifully. Now, the question is immediately, yeah, uh, uh, is the screen exclusively limited to philosophy? I mean, where do you include the work with, to put it very simple, yeah? let's say the work with what that is into this properly Deleuzean investment of, let's say, the philosophical screen? Tu as compris pas? Oui. Oui. D'abord, je voudrais. Je suis d'accord avec ces rapprochements avec Nietzsche par rapport au cri, mais, mais ce qui me semble là fondamental, c'est que c'est que il y a une, une philosophe qui a fait une interprétation du cri nichien, c'est-à-dire qui appelle qui appelant qui appelant nous penser des, des Heidegger, euh, c'est centré sur euh, l'écrit de Nietzsche. 
il faut, il écrit, qui va être interprété, c'est n'importe quel écrit, c'est les desserts croix, ou les desserts puce, ou les desserts s'étendent. Et alors, il, 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 si on prend compte que, que quelqu'un, par exemple, comme Derrida, va vouloir timpaniser la philosophie vers cette voie d'écouter les cris des de philosophes, il me semble que la façon dont on les articule, les cris de la création conceptuelle, est, est vraiment un point de rupture avec, euh, avec euh, toute une tradition de, de cette lecture. D'ailleurs, plus important encore, Derrida va faire une critique de la voix, de la voix phénoménologique. Il va faire toute une critique des, du signe signifiant, si on veut, pour, pour euh, mettre un insergé quoi, un signe indicatif comme on la trace. Alors, c'est pour ça que je crois que quelque chose de très important se passe entre, dans l'interprétation du cri que ça va faire entre, disons, cette tradition et ce qui est des... Et par rapport à la, à la question de... de du rapprochement du cri avec, euh, disons, la non-philosophie, il y a deux choses, est ce, qui est, ce qui est un peu particulier, c'est que l'écrit d'ailleurs, comme il apparaît dans les cours de 1980, très avant, très 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 avant que ça se pose la question, ou oh, que ça devient écrit la question de qu'est-ce que c'est la philosophie, mais dans les cours, on oh, est déjà en train de travailler cette question de l'esprit, en effet qui se pose ces questions, l'écrit va, va apparaître comme un élément d'exclusivité, si on veut, de la philosophie. Et l'écrit va apparaître comme l'écrit philosophique. Dans les premières cours, c'est comme ça, on va classer les philosophes, parce que les philosophes, c'est quelqu'un qui écrit. Quelques années après, il a rencontré Batari, euh, dans l'écrit, dans cette classification qu'ils ont fait des philosophes, ils vont apparaître aussi des personnages, disons, de la littérature, qui écrit et qui, et qui, et qui, et qui font partie. Mais au-delà de ça, c'est au moment donné, on ne laisse pas dire que l'écrit, pour entendre l'écrit, pour, en, pour en, en interpréter écrit, écrit, il, il faut raison d'un effort supplémentaire qui est non philosophique. Euh, il est en train de dire à ce moment-là que il y a une, cette non philosophie qui est au cours, au cours de la philosophie, euh, euh, c'est tout philosophique euh, dans lesquels disons l'art, la science et la philosophie vont se croiser passent par cette interprétation de l'écrit en étant l'écrit à la fois singularisant de la philosophie et en étant à la fois si on peut dire extérieur auprès de la philosophie voilà je crois qu'elle permet les deux choses marquer de cette singularité et aussi les rapports c'est un très très bon complément à ce que tu as. Changing argument uh, is uh, uh, intitulated uh, on the logics of forces uh, between the laws and violence. Um, or that means the laws. And uh, I start uh, with the question of the substance versus force. Politeness, the metaphysical problem of inquiring the nature of substance, comes along with a geometrical physical procedure relative to the research uh, of its own means of construction. The question of construction um, uh, implies the necessity to conceive a body as something more than extension. That is, to think it in terms of a potential transformation. What are the necess uh, necessary philosophical means to think substance in terms of transformation? The predicate needs to be inherent to the subject, that is, virtually included. Subject and predicate 
are not bound by feature of tradition, but by means of the constitution of a relation. Substance, therefore, therefore, is not defined in terms of its essence, but as, quote, the active source of its own modifications, its own, of its own ways of being. And of God. That is, substance is the factor inseparable from its own ways of being. Thus cannot be defined outside its own manieres, but includes the whole realms of our expressions. A realm which is in principle infinite. What nevertheless delimits the boundary of infinitude is the constitutive force of its own nature, its own power of action. This power of action is what generates the event of transformation. This event, as the Lewis remarks, is produced by the predicates which for Leibniz are intended in terms of a relation and not of a network. Quote, the nature of an individual substance or of a complete being is to have a notion so complete that it is sufficient to include and to allow the deduction of all the predicates of the subject to which this notion is attributed. The conception of a complete being is the bond to constitutive multiplicity and constitutes an operation of both inclusion and deduction of all the predicates relative to a particular subject. Inclusion implies that the predicates are in a way incorporated within the subject. Otherwise expressed, it means that the subject cannot be fully defined outside its relation with the predicates. In disagreement with the equation established by Descartes, Descartes conceived the moving force and the movement produced by it in a relation of equivalence, Leibniz conceives a relation of correspondence between force and its effect. Force <coughs> entails thus a more real character than movement, inasmuch as movement as such does not account for the relations of interdependence between a number of bodies. This more real character is what counts for its metaphysical status. Force becomes the cause, the cause of corporeal substance, providing an explanation of corporeal substance outside extended phenomena. Due uh, to this movement of the traction of form, force determines substance in abstracto. What is then the effect of force? It is the production of an inner transformation of substance, but also the production of the nexus itself. The notion of transformation itself implies both the onset of a gradual change, but also the persistence of unvaried parts. For this act, the unity of substance uh, is split into a plurality of states of relationships. A multiplicity is created within a unity. As Gould puts it, force constitutes an internal power of expansion, by which uh, the monad qua multiplicity becomes active. Its activity consists in the extraction of a modality of confrontation between a particular case of transformation and another one. It consists in the ability to seize the condition of possibility of transformation itself. A stage coming prior to the unfolding of the particularity of each transformative act, and which indeed does not encompass it. If if movement expresses the variation in and to trans in transformation, force accounts for its cause. For its cause. On a more general level, the activity of the monad can be understood in terms of the constitution of an axis point between cause and effect. Dynamical laws pertaining to the domain of physics uh, can be translated to that of metaphysics. As Mitchell Serre remarks, if there exists a metaphysics of a physical mechanism and dynamism, there also has to exist a metaphysical mechanism and dynamism. What are the metaphysical me features of force? How can we think the power of expansion uh, in metaphysical terms? A text uh, written between 1683 uh, and 1686, um, how to distinguish real phenomena from imaginary ones, Leibniz attributes solely to force the ability to grasp some reality. While features of extended bodies such as light, heat, color, 
Now, the cement uh, qualities are merely appearances. The bodily substance consists in the force of acting and of suffering. This equation requires an idea of substance which takes distance from that of substantial form. Morphe gets applied by an activity which, in the Leibnizian universe, becomes metaphysically necessary. As Russell explains it, activity measures the degree of quality characterizing each temporal state of substance, in virtue of which that state is not permanent, but tends to pass to the next state. Russell points out the difference between the notion of activity and that of causation. While the latter is constitutive of a relation between two phenomena in virtue of which one is succeeded by the other, activity expresses the quality by which one phenomenon, one phenomenon tends to cause another. Activity is an attribute corresponding to the relation of causality. It is an attribute which much belongs to the subject of changing states so far as those states are developed out of the nature of the subject itself. Activity is not mere relation. It is an actual quality of substance, forming an element in each state of the substance in virtue of which the state is not permanent, but tends to give, another place, uh, give place to another. Substance becomes thus intrinsically an intrinsically dynamic entity, capable to transform and to transform itself, while activity comes to measure the degree of such change. It is this mutation in the notion of substance conceived not, a really const uh, not as a really constituted entity, but rather in terms of a regulated tendency, which allows to grasp the centrality entailed by the notion of force in Lamin's form. Force is a metaphysical matter whose strength varies, varies according to the degrees of expression of substances. Force is passive in as much as substances express something in a confused way, and active in the opposite case in which expression becomes distant. It is by considering force in its relation to activity as a substance that Leibniz comes to define an extended notion of force, which gets extracted from physical principles without remaining bound to them. In difference to capacity, a concept describing exclusively the possibility of action deriving from external stimuli, force entails a character of entity. Action gets conceived in terms of its own form of production. Force thus constitutes the principle of action in as much as it passes of itself into action. The rules by which this procedure of expansion is made possible um, are the two principles constituting the basis of reasoning. The principle of contradiction and that of sufficient reasons. The paragraph 142 of monologue furnish a brief definition. While the law of contradiction states the opposition between true and false, the second one um, claims a principle of reason as being the moments of both reality and existence. How is this principle connected with the notion of activity? The intrinsic dynamical condition of substance implies a transformation over time. But how can this transformation be conceived? How is it possible to infer knowledge about its future states given in that, its actual conditions? The causal condition implicit in the principle of sufficient reason accounts for connection between different states. However, the principle goes further. It does not show only that a particular chain of course, but also why it does. Also uh, uh, resumes it by claiming that the sufficient reason is to be found in the nature of activity itself. This does not mean that the connection between two states would be necessary in this predictable. It is rather the consequence of the passing condition of an act of perception, which both involves and represents a multiplicity in the unit or in the simple substance. This passing condition or momentary increment demarcates the more real aspect of force, more real than the sum, the sum of all increments defining the whole trajectory. Force is, more real, force is thus more real than uh, both space and motion. It is the transformatory character of force which enables to grasp an extra quantum of reality, a transformation by which um, a monad or a simple substance is, gets created. 
Creation is almost bound to an operation of outer creation, is as much as substance acquires a sufficiency which makes them the source of the internal activities and render them, so to speak, incorporeal automatons. automatons. It is in this regard that the concept of force intervenes in terms of a metaphysical principle of corporeal individuation and thus in the creation of the uh, corporeal mechanisms of perception. Perceptions are generally insensible. So now from force to perception, this is where it comes to the conclusion. It is only with the upsurge to a status of clarity that an idea can arise to formation. But clear perceptions cannot unfold within without the existence of insensible perceptions. Otherwise stated, it is through the increase and in intensification of insensible perceptions that clear perceptions are enabled. Spontaneous activity arises when clear perception re, re, clear perceptions reach a stage of organization. This form of organization demarcates the basis for all activity of reflection and thought. The sensible perceptions account for the degree of independence from external world. They constitute a form of internal proto-organization by which the innate frees itself both from a straightforward connection to the external world as well as from a dogmatic presupposition of general proofs. It is through the action of insensible perceptions that a disposition uh, gets developed, which builds up, uh, upon past traces and expressions. Innate ideas are conceived in terms of a natural disposition from which the spirit reflects upon the given of the sensible experience. They constitute the mean by which clear perceptions free themselves from confused ones and come to constitute the conditions for the emergence of an act of knowledge. And the question which, uh, uh, which, by which I'd like to finish um, and uh, pose in this regard is, um, uh, and poses a problem more than uh, having an answer, is if and under what conditions this form of knowledge might come to constitute an artistic uh, versus aesthetic problem. about trying to make art with a heavy ontology and a heavy uh, metaphysics of space, basically. So, um, just I found out that this is going to be re recorded, so I want to clarify something in my, uh, in my um, abstract. Um, I'm interested in manifolds as a structure of, uh, of what Deleuze defines to be uh, ideas and, and multiplicities. Um, and I'm interested in how we can use the, the notion of manifold in, in different uh, domains. Uh, in that particular um, presentation, Riemann does not explicitly use uh, music or sound as a continued multiplicity. I may, may have implied that in my presentation, so uh, in my abstract, so yeah. that. Instead, confusingly, is uh, Bergson who defines uh, sound as a, as a um, continuous qualitative uh, multiplicity which is misleading because um, in my reading of uh, Bergsonism, uh, Deleuze forces uh, Riemann upon uh, Bergson. 
So that's just to clarify that part. Actually, though, Bernard Riemann is very, very interested in sound. He's interested in unifying from the notion of a manifold to unify a theory that connects uh, both manifolds and um, manifold structures of space, but then that can be extrapolated and extended to matter itself. So a general theory that um, uh, merges uh, physics, magnetism, light, and ultimately sound. So actually, one of his, la his last essay of Bernard Riemann is actually the mechanism of the ear, which is a fascinating essay. It's in contradistinction to Helmholtz's understanding of tone. Um, and if you're interested in sound and what a multiplicity, uh, what a, a manifold of sound could be, I highly recommend uh, looking into this essay. Uh, both in method 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 methods, uh, the mechanism of the ear. It's uh, posthumously uh, published, and uh, it's about a. a um, a criticism on Helmholtz's uh, understanding of, 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 of the tone, on how, of how the ear works so that we can perceive tone. Actually, be because of this essay, uh, Helmholtz then uh, replies there, there is actually a lot of tension, actually. Uh, Helmholtz uh, has the, uh, he calls Riemann a, um, an amateur, which is uh, ridiculous, but um, uh, he actually incorporates that notion of a space, and that's why we can now talk easily about the color space. So that comes out quite easily now, but uh, Riemann was the first one to say that actually color is a manifold, and there can be other things as manifolds, including sound. So that was just corrections. Um, but if we were strict enough about what sound really is, which is motion in space, then you could say that uh, it's also to use manifold in that strict understanding of, of uh, motion in a, in a sort of lived space. Nevertheless, the title of my uh, essay is going to be very, very light um, in philosophy and mathematics. I'm going to spend more time talking about a piece I made. Um, it's called Homeomorphic Sound. I'm going to explain what's homeomorphic in a second. Um, but first I want to clarify a few things, so I'm going to just read through this and then present that piece. And I promise there's going to be some sound as well, so you can, you know, not feel, don't feel jealous of those guys in the room. So, uh, I will not be presenting a, f a philosophical argument or engaging in any exposition of mathematical proofs, even though my presentation will borrow from both disciplines. Instead, I will try to express some of the challenges I experienced when working on sound and other media that relate to my background in philosophy of mathematics. Having overcome some of the obstacles, I will talk about a recent conflict. Okay, I just said that, so I'm going to skip that. Before delving into what homeomorphic sound might be, I want to just throw four remarks in kind of aphoristic form which can be understood, that, uh, understood as the underlying premises uh, of the way I understand uh, and how I work with uh, this media, sound and other media. So, my first sort of aphoristic uh, premise is any materialism is a planism and therefore the law of continuity holds. This is admittedly a planism, meaning that I don't know how there can be a materialism without being a planist uh, at the same time. I've looked, I don't know if there's such a position. The whole critique of the negative is a critique against the existence of non-being. However, as contradictory as it may appear, there is non-being, but only in the form of problematic ideas. Ideas are inseparable from the solutions and already involve the conditions of their solvability. So this is chapter 4 of Difference and Repetition. So the eye and the ear, I want to add, solve the problems of light and sound in ways already prefigured by the problems of light and sound. Once a pro number two, once a problem is solved, its very solutions become new problems themselves. This is why artistic creation, I think, is the art of rearticulating and redistributing the problems of the sensible. So once the organs solve the problem of light and of, of sound, then we have the problem of rhythm, the problem of tonality, the problem of timbre, the problem of color, the problem of representation, the problem of montage, the problem of the medium, the problem of the material. Since media, number three, since media became art's problem, then a pertinent challenge to contemporary art, in my uh, view, is to reevaluate the role of the digital in the production and mediation of art. The digital problematizes the relationship the dimensional way in which we understand different disciplines. If the digital, as the name itself suggests, uh, digits means, you know, just fingers, so numbers, belongs to the domain of the numerically uh, discrete, how does that affect art's ontology? In other words, to use the kind of Deleuzean approach, if blocks of sensations are to be found in matter, what can be found in the locus of the digital? 
other than numbers? What's the relationship then of numbers and uh, in the digital domain? Where are the blocks of sensation in the digital domain, basically? This is, I think, and this is number four now, my general premise, this is, I think, where uh, Riemann's concept of a manifold uh, is relevant and, and, and quite rich. Considering its exposition, again, in his habilitation thesis, manifolds as concepts of abstract space are as philosophical as they are mathematical, and any hypothesis about them can and should be tested experientially and experimentally with matter. That's almost a condition for Riemann. Without physics involved, uh, there's no point of talking about manifolds, really, in order to determine the metric principle that binds them, and so forth. Which is why the manifold becomes an indispensable concept, I think, to Deleuze's ontology. Without its immanent character in, the, in its methodology, uh, there cannot be a philosophically consistent substantive multiplicity. Multiplicity is, by the way, the, the term that the less reads of Bergson, of how he thinks uh, Bergson is reading Riemann. But the term is, is manifold. I think it's better. It, it captures better that idea of, of multi folding the same thing, but no, many times. Nevertheless, therefore, it is important to stress that manifolds are more than mere mathematical structures. Again, Riemann will talk about color and so forth. In general, they can be manifolds as structures of space that have little to do with mathematics, which begs the question, how do we talk about the space of sound? What type of space does it occupy? This is not the musical space in the model that Deleuze draws in a, in a mill plateau. Um, that one actually is a bit disappointing because it's just limited to pitch and uh, only talking by means of Boulez's work and distinction between smooth and striated. But if you look very carefully, this is just a pitch. And at best, it's the diagonal between um, horizontal and, and um, um, uh, horizontal and perpendicular sort of composition. Right? So there's no, the only, uh, diam uh, let's say, dimension of, of that musical space is not sound itself, it's pitch within this very, very restrained uh, sort of framework, which, um, the space of sound itself is much, much, much richer, especially when we consider its multidimensionality. Now, considering the, two ty the distinction between the two types of multiplicities, quantitative and qualitative, we turn towards sound and its production, which is what I'm personally interested in, you know, what I got trapped myself for many years, in the so-called analog versus digital essentialist divide. Essentialist divide. It is tempted to assume that the digital belongs to the numerical, um, and therefore, uh, it must correspond to the quantitative multiplicity or quantitative manifold, and therefore the analog, which involves material signals and electricity, must uh, be in the qualitative domain. Um, the digital, uh, for that matter, corresponds sometimes by representing the material one uh, in terms of numbers. So, I'm going to show some examples in a second. This is admittedly what I have thought. This is the trap I fell into with respect to the digital and the analog for a long time. Uh, and this is, I think, the type of a false dualism that Deleuze warns us in when we were thinking about dialects of the one and the many and so forth. Just like the one and the many, these categories are simply too big and too general. So we need to get a bit more uh, concise um, so we can actually start thinking rather than sort of, you know, trying to catch our tails or thing. So, the solution to this problem, I think, is um, with my understanding, this notion of homeomorphic sound that I'm trying to explain a bit, and I'm going to spend more time talking about this piece, actually. So it's going to make more sense in, in a few seconds. So uh, the solution to this problem is precisely the concept of manifold, since it's made up of different topological patches without submitting to a global essentialistic determinations. So there cannot be just the analog or the digital. It's going to be a lot of patches of different metric relationships, and those metric relations, those patches, uh, somehow merge with one another. We cannot know what's going to be next to it, what's going to be a metric principle. Uh, we can only talk about the local determination of the space we're in. The variability of the topological structure of a manifold means that we can only refer to local determinations without alluding to this general structure. Moving beyond manifolds, and this is now uh, where the homeomorphisms come in, uh, to even more abstract topological spaces, continuity, and this is what something I, I, haven't, I hadn't had clear until very recently, is no longer an essential character of a single space. Instead, continuity between topological spaces is 
validated only if you have a function that maps from one space to another and it's inverse mapping it back to the original one. What that means is going to be mostly exposed in, in the piece I made, which we're going to hear a bit in a second. So bear with me. But the idea is that continuity is no longer this idea of, of, of just the qualitative and so forth. If you're talking about topological spaces, then you're talking about this constant a function takes something and places, maps it somewhere else. If you can do that in one direction and you can bring it back forth in the same way without losing properties of, of whatever these uh, spaces are, then you have uh, guaranteed continuity, co uh, topological continuity. Therefore, if a function it's, and its inverse transforms the space onto one another continuously and vice versa, then no matter what the spaces are, they are homeomorphic to one another. So that's what homeomorphisms are. It's a, it's a simple idea. You take a function, it's in this domain, you put it here. If you can manage to bring it back in the same way without any disruption, then you have a continuity between uh, two spaces. This is what I'm currently working on, and this is not just for sound, I think this can be also for uh, different sort of media. So I'm quite interested in this kind of merge of topology as a way of articulating experience and uh, see how it can be activated or materialized, uh, actualized, to use the Deleuzean expression. So, moving on now to my actual... I don't know how long, how, how long did I go there? Oh, uh, yeah, I uh, have another two minutes. Okay, all right, great. So, um, the, um, this is the presentation. The piece I, I called it was to render audible. This should sound really familiar. What the role of, of, of uh, you know, Paul Cleese says is to render the visible, not the visible, to render the visible. So I'm trying to do the same thing with sound, but using these notions from uh, space. To talk a bit about my sort of, get setting aside now the te technical part of things, uh, my own personal sort of poetic reason behind was this poem, poem I read from Neruda in 2007 or 8. I chopped off the romantic part, I left the uh, important part, which is basically this quotation here. Um, if you're dealing with a big ontology, then you're preoccupied whether something gets lost in that process. My concern has been whether the digital, in trying to replicate the analog, something gets lost on the way. So, this is um, sort of the issue with continuous and discrete. Um, this is, a, let's say, a, a, a sort of a signal, which is, you know, perfectly straight and no, no discontinuities, but as soon as we try to recreate this signal in a computer, which this you wouldn't be able to tell the difference acoustically, but my concern is whether something gets lost, like I said earlier in that point. For you to represent this signal, actually what you have to do is you chop up this continuous signal into little numbers, little values, and then you try to recreate that sound within the computer and you, you sort of uh, speed it up. And it, it sounds exactly the same. Uh, it's very, very difficult to tell the difference. But again, my preoccupation is because of mathematics and because of ontology, I'm preoccupied with, is something lost in that process? And if something lost, how do we recover it? Or how do we rethink this relation between continuous and discrete so that we can generate new things rather than trying to represent? And this is again what I initially have with the digital, is actually that, if you notice, whenever there's a new technology, we're always trying to recreate the analog one, when it should be actually an open field and not a whole new open domain that open up, opens up infinite possibilities. I'm going to show one today, but um, this is, I think, a paradox of today's uh, sort of uh, tools creation, trying to replicate that tape that worked in the 60s or trying to make, you know, simulation of an app, <coughs> when really there are two discrete, two different domains. So, the piece I made was uh, based, it was called Blocks, part of an exhibition, and it was uh, basically trying to uh, translate or transform uh, sound on based on this uh, piece of marble. Now, this piece of marble was, is done by a company, which I'm going to talk about in a bit in a second, but the way they do it is by using uh, parametric design, so uh, sort of processes, uh, digital processes, uh, with data that they send out to literally a computer, and then scra scrapes off this uh, marble to make these uh, sort of unique surfaces. This actually is done in Cyprus, which is half where I'm from, and Cyprus is an oceanic island, like the ones that Deleuze uh, describes in desert islands, um, and the data used for this um, material process was actually the formation of, the, of Cyprus, which is 
made up of two uh, plates, uh, you know, crushing with one another. So using that information to make this piece of marble. Uh, if you notice here, I'm always using this kind of thing. This is how the whole panel actually looks like, and it captures, uh, I think, decades worth of, of, of data of how sort of some things, uh, how, how the plates sort of move with one another. Um, this um, piece is the, it's just a slice of this overall one, and it's the one I, I use to translate sonically, uh, uh, audibly, yeah? So, what I, what I was given was the digital, the, uh, digital rendering of this uh, sort of computer. What I try to do is use this information to end with sound, trying to make a piece out of it. Um, this is a synth, I don't know if anyone here makes music or works with sound. This is a, called, a synth called Metasynth, which sounds really cool, if you don't know what it does. Uh, it's kind of like a, uh, yeah, like metaphysics, Metasynth, yeah. So it's a, when I first, when I first came out, I, I immediately got it because it looked like a fascinating idea, that you take any photo, you put it into here, and you do something with the information of pixels. Uh, I've owned this software for five years, I've never used it until this piece because, uh, again, getting caught up in my ontology and mathematics, I couldn't justify using this for the sake of transformation uh, or just because it makes cool sounds. So I was trying to find a more legitimate artistic reason to use this sort of so uh, software. Nevertheless, this is a software which you, you know, just put like a, an image and it, it translates it either in uh, spectral information, so you can make a, uh, an instrument out of this information, or you can use a filter to literally scrape off frequencies as it moves along. So conveniently, I, I actually had a timeline of process, of a material process uh, of the Earth, literally of my, of my island Cyprus, and I had here a representation of that on a timeline. So what this would do is I would take, put any recording I wanted here and scan through the image that I wanted. This is just a, a kind of, it's a software, yeah? Now, the process of getting sounds out of this, what I did was literally uh, through both contact mic and hydrophone, so recording the process as close as I could get to this uh, piece of diamond. So this is a diamond going really, really fast, scraping off grains of marble. Uh, to get these this, uh, sort of uh, textures. The water, which I want to just point out, is very, very important because actually it turns out that if you have these small particles of dust, if it's not cleaned off, then it actually breaks, it can crack. So there's a big paradox there of having this really concrete marble being shaved off literally dust by dust, but then without the water, which looks very innocent in this image, it's just kind of there spraying. Without it, you have uh, actually the whole thing uh, uh, collapses really. So um, I tried using kind of some metaphors from this process, literally grains, which sounds a bit like you know granular synthesis, and um, the notion that if you remove matter from any object, you change its, its fundamental frequency. Fundamental frequency is basically any frequency that uh, uh, two minutes uh, a thing can uh, oscillate uh, uh, naturally. Yeah. So. Basically, here are the processes I, I did for my synthesis, granular synthesis. I messed with the images that I had, stretched them, do some naive topological transformations. Because um, I really want you to hear a bit the sound. I'm just going to kind of scan through this quickly. Um, with the render image, I, I, again, I did through a lot of transformation. Uh, some of them very naive. I just kind of stretched the image to get some topological transformations, let's say. Different colors changed the topology of the image. Uh, emphasis on its uh, singularities, as it were. Um, this is ultimately the piece, how it looked like this lighting is not ideal, but I want you to listen a bit because otherwise this is pointless. Uh, a piece should stand on its own, according to the less. So it would be terrible if I just talk all this and not let you hear. So, uh, two minutes of sound and then I'll. Uh, yeah. So, here it goes.
surfaces because yeah. singularity is uh, it's used but the singularity means it's a, it's a point where it's no longer differentiable so that's the official meaning of it but then you have all this um, I mean the singularities here are also like the little grains that are being chopped off um, what's the role of so which one do you refer to similarity of the surface or similarity of the, of the material, of the material. Uh, so grains so that's the only thing I can think of um, uh, uh, what, what's the impact of this similarity the, of the part of the yeah, yeah. Um, why well, I use that's the thing I try to use like um, bad analogies cheesy analogies um, if I could say like I, yeah, I'm not too proud of them but you know in, in uh, the way that Zanakis defines granular synthesis is just if you can break down sound to its the smallest wall is like you know little grains of, of sound. So I was trying to draw this analogy, which is you know my lack of artistic training. I think though between what would be then that that and I, I try to picture this. Any 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 time I found some very very small sound, I would try to like zoom into that and with granular synthesis try to kind of scrape off uh, in that. So I think that's the 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 lowest sort of element the way I did was in, in the, the piece that I trying to make. But you can't hear this. I mean, all this is like a lot of layers. This is like many, many layers of, of what's going on there. But the one you were hearing, this one, I think some little clips, that was the smallest I could get. So uh, for granular synthesis, you can go out to milliseconds and make them multiple. So, yeah. Um, earlier you were talking about how, how I would, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that you were 
go to with this distinction between the analog and the digital and the question of whether or not something gets lost along the way. Yeah. So, do you think something gets lost? Uh, yeah, along I think you so. I don't want to talk about that actually. Um, my my uh, preoccupation was to assign ahead of time essential sort of properties to analog and digital. I actually come more and more and think about the digital theoretically and philosophically. I realize that actually paradoxically it's the other way around. It's the digital because of its openness to be anything that it can be, to be defined in any, any possible way. Actually, it can, I think, open up things that we would have been unimaginable before. I mean, of course, this happened already. Now, in the translation of the analog to the digital, I think something is lost, absolutely, but the, the error has been to try to translate the digital or to imitate or to represent with the digital the analog. So, for example, you, you'll see in, in different like, kind of popular tools, so Photoshop or something like that, you get a bit of grain, you can put grain on your photos. No, you can't. It's not the same. It's a chemical process very specific to you know, film photography, which is that, that's perfectly fine. With digital, we can make images that would be un unthinkable with film camera. So I no longer feel that uh, sort of young poetic sort of Neruda's take that something gets lost. I'm more positive or affirmative now, perhaps this is the less helping me out in, my, in the process, of there is two domains, they are distinct, no reason why we should confuse them. In fact, we shouldn't try and pretend one is the other and find interesting ways or interesting tools that we can actually make legitimate uh, transformations from one domain to another. The media we have right now are, are, are proliferating. There's going to be more media uh, in the next few decades. And we need to embrace the digital in a completely different way. So far we're trying to uh, go with the model that, uh, I don't know, um, coding and, and tools for, for uh, running different kind of signals uh, run. So we try to do with efficiency and what's going to be the best possible of doing. Where, whereas I think we should go down to the sort of elements of coding, of software engineering, whatever, to try and rethink how that's going to make us uh, make new media, make new sensation, make new block of sensations, which we don't know they're there. So that's, uh, I really feel strong about it. So thank you. Maybe yeah, I take uh, I, not, uh, uh, I take maybe your question about singularity and actually what you said uh, at the end. I mean, uh, I really like the sound, and in a way, I, I was thinking of uh, um, uh, uh, that my problem of somehow creating a state of singularity, a state of perceptual singularity, out of draw, drawing back. Uh, um, to, to Leibniz is, uh, was actually very much uh, uh, expressed by, by the music at the end. Um, and uh, um, I kind of also was wondering in a way, and also in a way in this relation between uh, uh, the problem of analog digital, if this could not be addressed if the, the sound that you at the end hear, that is uh, that goes back to a form of, of let's say substance of matter in a in a much stronger way than uh, than the uh, the description of it which before and, uh, um, could not be the starting point of uh, a rearticulation yeah. basically of the categories itself themselves. Yeah, I, I don't understand why there's, uh, I mean, Deleuze is really good at this, he, he um, in, in the refrain, towards the end, he talks about the synthesizer, so he's really up to date with what's going on in terms of, you know, new sort of ways of creating sound. He acknowledges that there is, uh, you know, a synthesizer as being this machine, which is, is, is he says it's the machine, if there needs to be an, a machine for the assemblage of harness and forces, then it's the synthesizer. And that's whatever the date is of uh, Mil Plateau, 86, right? And um, then there's no talk about this whole new other domain. So um, my question is, my question is the same. Like if ultimately it's in matter itself that the sound fluctuates and generates whatever, then 
again, to put the original question, where are these blocks of sensations? It cannot be just in matter, in the way that Deleuze describes it uh, uh, everywhere about uh, the relation between the uh, material and the blocks of sensations and um, sensation itself. So, in uh, what is philosophy, he'll say repeatedly that it's in matter. Sometimes you, don't, you can't tell the difference between the matter and the, the sensation, because they, they fuse, there's this one thing, right? I'm, I'm, I'm still wondering, what's that relation to sound? He kind of almost uh, very methodically avoids that particular question. He talks sometimes about the hammering, so that's, you know, generation of sound. Sometimes he talks about some sort of instruments, alludes to some instruments. But ultimately sound is no longer, I mean, we're beyond the stage which is just instrument. Sound can come from anything, can be a legitimate source of, of sound and digital as well. So where, where is the material here? I, I, I still, that's a question I'm wondering myself. But it seems like it has to be the medium, just like other art forms have the media. The medium of sound is... is yeah, but uh, uh, the, the, the sounds that we heard was, uh, was, was material. Yes. And more stronger than, well, than the, the question, I mean, it had a very material effect. Yeah. It was, but that's the thing, I want to play that with that idea. It, it sounds like it should be. I think that what I did try to do a lot here actually is kind of to get over my own problem uh, contradiction actually. Anything that sounds like it's mechanical and matter, it's actually all, all, all fake. And anything that actually sounds like it's fake, that's actually the real material. So that's the dialectic I try to play. So you hear some stuff that sounds like shh, kind of, that, that's completely fake. Uh, it's made up, it's digital. But, you know, the problem is, of course, you want your, you know, because it sounds and it represents that, and so I, I try to play with that idea. Uh, so that it's not clear, it's not clear which one is the matter, which is the matter, and which is the digital. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be able to overcome the dualism if I, if I went for, say, for the matter. So I use that material, but uh, the material, after the transformation has gone through, it's in, impossible to trace it back, it becomes something so uh, I, I want to say something but I'm not sure if it's a, sort, of, sort of too naive because I, I, I have to apologize I came in, I, I thought you were I, I was interested, my interest was peaked and I, I came in for the last part of your presentation, but I mean so the, I mean, there's the materiality that you're talking about, so sort of literal of the, you know, the things that you uh, use as examples, and but and you say fake, which is strange. But what about? I mean, there's also, I mean, artificial. what? Artificial. Let's artificial. Okay, artificial. Um, because fake sounds, it yeah. just, it's yeah, a fake. weird concept. But um, but I mean, it, I mean, there, there's the materiality. I mean, not just of what, uh, of, uh, you know, that 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 you were talking about. But I mean, there's materiality. I mean, sound in order for sound to be Present, we we're, it, 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 even if it's coming from a synthesizer. I mean, it's also it's about it's it, it's it requires sort of the materiality of, of vibra like there, there's yeah. vibration and 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 the sound being generated now is not fake, yeah. right? And it also is something material. I mean, there's there's a materiality to the sound of my voice, uh, to the sound that even though it's from a synthesizer. I mean, what about that particular? Yeah, and, and that's the uh, sort of the, what I struggle with a lot conceptually yeah. is that uh, if you get lost in this world of producers and people who follow this analog digital thing, many people swear by the organic uh, imperfection of the analog, and mm -hmm. every time you try to recreate that with the digital, the, the differences are, are noticeable, mm -hmm. and that's the argument of that divide. And I got lost in that for, for, a, for a few years mm -hmm. uh, of that question because if you're grounded to this ontology of like everything is matter, therefore uh, we must account and use material conditions to create this or extract this, uh, you know, this uh, block of sensations, mm -hmm. then in the computer the issue, the critical sort of issue here is that I think there should be an opening of the tools of the, these digital tools to precisely get over the representation of the material. So that would be like the, if I had an argument here, mm -hmm. would be that that uh, the digital is not cannot recreate. It's impossible. I mean, in every possible sense, to create the material, but it doesn't mean that we cannot create these new sensations precisely by means of the medium. 
Okay. Uh, so that, uh, for example, that image the, of the of the marble stretch on there uh, uses, for example, um, spectral analysis, which is Fourier transformations. Uh, that's impossible to do with any other mean other than a computer. And even that is imperfect, uh, because for a Fourier transform to be effective, you need infinite terms, so there's no infinite time, therefore you get uh, approximations of any complex sum. But even that, the fact that you can recreate a fake instrument, so that towards the end of the, his, uh, the three minutes that I played, the little note, notes of it, that's a uh, completely unexistent instrument. It comes from the spectral information of the image itself. So it's completely, if you could take an instrument and decompose it to what makes its natural frequencies, then you have this image as well, which has pixels, and those pixels create a spectrum of information, and that from there you can create an instrument. That, those no, nodes and the tuning, the microtonal tuning was, for example, uh, new ways of creating yeah, uh, sounds that are not, that are material, but without presupposing this kind of essentialistic attributes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>